Welcome everybody to Medical Justice and the Carceral State, Part 3, the doctor's white coat versus the officer's uniform who calls the shots. We will be starting in a moment. We just want to let Zoom load everybody. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Medical Justice in the Carceral State, Part 3, the doctor's white coat versus the officer's uniform who calls the shots. My name is Carmel Shahar, and I'm the executive director of the Petrie Flom Center for Health Law Policy, Biotechnology, and Bioethics at Harvard Law School. This event, as you may suspect from the inclusion of Part 3 in the title, is part of a series that is co-sponsored not only by the Petrie Flom Center, but by the Justice, Health, and Democracy Impact Initiative of the Edmund J. Safra Center for Ethics, the Medical Justice Alliance, and the Harvard Ethics B Center for Health and Human Rights, as well as the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and Belonging at Harvard University. In addition, some of our Co-sponsors and collaborators on this event include the Institute to End Mass Incarceration and the Harvard Prison Legal Assistance Project, as well as the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation. I think this is going to be a really interesting and thoughtful discussion about the complications of what makes medical decision making so unusual and so challenging in the prison setting. I want to get to the substance of it as quickly as possible, but before that, a little bit of housekeeping. We really hope that you have questions. Our speakers would love to engage with them. The best way by far and away to submit your questions is to use the Q&A feature found in the meeting controls at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can also join the conversation or submit questions on Twitter using we're at Petrie Flom, and you can use hashtag medical justice. Again, that's hashtag medical justice. If you include a question, we'll pull it into the Zoom Q&A for you. If you have any technical issues, please email petrie-flom at law.harvard.edu, and we will try to help you. We will be sharing the fully captioned event video with all registrants within a couple weeks. If you like what you see, and I sure hope you do, please consider signing up for our newsletter. That's the best way to find out about Petrie Flom Center activities or about upcoming events or scholarship. Please go over to our blog, Bill of Health, which brings you cutting edge health policy, bioethics, health law analysis. That's really accessible. As well as consider attending some of our other events. We have a great event coming up looking at crisis standards of care and who they help and who they may burden, as well as thinking through what does the quote unquote new normal phase of this pandemic look like for vulnerable individuals? Are they being left behind? With that said, I also hope that you check out our co-sponsors. It's a really long list, but we've included some links here. And if you go to the event webpage, their pages are all linked as well. With that said, I'd like to introduce our speakers for the hour in no particular order. We have Rachel Bedard, who is an internist, geriatrician, and palliative care physician. Mercedes Montagna, who is executive director of the Promise of Justice Alliance, as well as Susan Neubauer, who is a nurse practitioner. Our moderator for the day is Will Weber, who is the National Medical Director of the Medical Justice Alliance. Will, I'd like to hand it over to you. Yeah, so thank you so, so much for uh, joining us today in this discussion. Uh, today, we'll be really just focusing on the interplay between medical staff and carceral facilities. Um, so they're, first and foremost, as, as a medical provider, uh, my duty and, and those who practice in carceral facilities is to the patient. And they are really trying to take care of the medical needs of their patients. But uh, that being said, carceral facilities do have 
uh, numerous barriers um, that can conflict with uh, medical recommendations and provision of standard care. So um, just uh, we will be uh, jumping into discussing the various points uh, where discrepancies can arise between the goals of clinicians and then those of the crossroads settings. Um, specifically, we'll kind of talk about the initiation of care and accessing medical care, um, the actual provision of the care and how individuals receive the medical care, and then about a little bit more about uh, uh, medical decision making and how uh, physicians and and facilities and the patients can interact and better do that. Now we want to provide you tangible tips and so we have uh, very experienced lawyers and clinicians who can help uh, support with that. Um, but first we wanted to just discuss a little bit about the legal underpinnings of medical care in carceral settings. So I thought we'd open it up with uh, going to Mercedes. Um, would you first be willing, uh, for anyone who doesn't know kind of the, the legal background, for uh, carceral medical care. Um, what, is, what is the the law say about patients receiving medical care within the uh, carceral setting? So um, thank you so much for having me. Um, and um, I'm really, this is a topic of, about which I have a lot of passion. So I'm happy to be here, especially with clinicians and providers because um, I think that's, that's who the conversation needs to be between. The law is not, is not robust in this area. Um, we find our protections for people who are incarcerated in the Eighth Amendment um, on, on the ban of cruel and unusual punishment. And occasionally on, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, which um, forbids the um, discrimination by the state against people for um, their disabilities. Um, and that crops up in all sorts of ways, which is long and complicated, but just have that in the back of your head if you're ever interested in litigating these cases. Um, and essentially what you have to prove is that um, the, the prison has or jail has been deliberately indifferent to a serious medical need um, and, the, and they have to be both objectively deliberately indifferent and subjectively. So what does that mean? That means objectively they have to do something that rises to the level of creating a substantial risk of serious harm to patients. This is not going to be um, a run-of-the-mill cut that doesn't get a bandage. This is going to be a serious and obvious medical need that is being ignored. Um, and then they have to show subjective um, deliberate indifference, which means that the prison officials knew about the issue and chose not to do anything about it. Um, and that is a very high bar to prove when you are a person who is incarcerated. Um, and it, is, and it, it requires quite a bit. Then you, you, you put on top of that something called the Prison Litigation Reform Act, which was a law that was passed in the mid 90s, which was essentially designed to make it incredibly hard for people who are incarcerated to seek redress from the federal courts. They put in place bound, uh, many barriers, including having to exhaust your claims through often opaque administrative processes within the institution. They put financial boundaries on it. They created massive disincentives for lawyers like me to take these cases um, and inability to recoup expenses and to get fees and the ways that we generally do in civil rights cases. And so I think when I talk about the legal framework around medic, medic, medical care for folks who are incarcerated, the thing that I always say is this is not how we're going to fix medical care for people who are inside. Um, this is a very blunt and sometimes incredibly ineffective tool because of all the legal barriers um, that exist. That said, these, these, they, this is also some of the only ways that we can shine light on what is happening inside of our systems. Um, and they become very important in lots of reasons. There's a reason I continue to do my job. Um, but as I said earlier, I think conversations between providers and attorneys and folks who are inside and their families and loved ones and communities is what's gonna push us forward. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, so it is, it is one of the only places in the United States where you have at least a constitutional right to medical care, though uh, there's a significant number of barriers to actually getting that medical care or seeking redress if you're not. Now, that's from the legal side. Turning to the medical side now, we'll have uh, Rachel just discuss a little bit more. Can you talk about different ways carceral facilities uh, and the medical care can be structured and kind of what jurisdiction they fall under as a physician? 
Sure. So, um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me. Um, my background is that I uh, ran something called the Geriatrics and Complex Care Service for the New York City jail system for the past five years. Um, so I saw patients on Rikers Island. Um, different correctional systems have different structures in the way provide healthcare in different ways and through different structures. Um, I worked for what's called an independent health authority. Um, this is the minority of systems have an independent health authority. And that's basically, I worked for an agency that had its own leadership um, and that did not in any way report up to the Department of Corrections. In the majority of systems around the country, um, the healthcare providers are, um, uh, part of the security apparatus. So for example, in the upstate prison system in New York State, um, the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision oversees the doctors and nurses, et cetera, who work in the prisons just as it oversees the correctional officers. That's a really important distinction to start with in your mind that there, it's very different whether um, uh, there's an independent health authority or not. The other thing to keep in mind is that there are systems that contract out the hiring and provision of medical care to for-profit medical com care companies. Um, Corizon is a very big one. WellPath is a very big one. WellPath is the entity that provides care in Massachusetts. Um, and this is essentially as though the prison system has hired an HMO to provide its care. Um, and that's worth noting because those companies have um, uh, a profit motive that is implicated in the way that they make decisions about how care is delivered, um, even beyond sort of the already complicated situation of how care is delivered in prison systems. Um, so uh, that's the first thing to sort of understand that there are different, there are different ways that this is structured in different systems around the country. Um, in most systems, um, there is some um, uh, way in which the system organizes following up patients who have chronic issues um, and providing sort of basic primary care and chronic disease management. And then there is also some system by which people can access what's usually called sick care, which is essentially like urgent care visits for an acute complaint. Um, something like I have a headache or I have a rash or whatever it is. Another really important thing to know is that in many systems, including, again, the Massachusetts Department of Corrections, there is a copay associated with seeking sick call for people that is meant to disincentivize them from um, overusing the system. Um, however, it you know, even a low copay for people who are fundamentally indigent and well incarcerated can provide a huge barrier to getting care. Um, so, so those are the two sort of main ways. And then the third thing that I would say is that when somebody is sick enough that they require hospital care or subspecialty care that is not provided on site at the facility where somebody is being held, um, systems have affiliated hospitals in the community where they will send someone. Um, Sometimes that's an affiliated hospital that has a dedicated ward that receives the patients who are incarcerated. Um, and that ward is often jointly sort of run by the hospital and the correctional authority. Sometimes it is um, a, a hospital that just takes those patients and those patients are on the regular medical floors. Okay. Well, thank you so much for outlining that. Yeah, there are significant differences, whether where, where the physician is hired uh, or the, the um, nurse practitioner or other clinician is hired. Um, and yeah, you bring up the, the point of copays. And of, oftentimes, even though it's a, a small copay, like a $5, $4 copay, many times these individuals who are incarcerated are working for around a dollar an hour. So it could be a copay that feels very insignificant, could be most of the day's work. Um, I was actually maybe going to cut over to Susan, who has worked uh, and to support clients who is uh, who have uh, had uh, is issues with the medical system. And I was going to ask, uh, just can you tell us a little bit more about when you've been working with your client or clients? Um, how often have they had delays in their care or difficulty actually accessing care? Hi. Well, thank you for having me as well. Um, I'll do my best to share my experience. Um, so I'm glad that Rachel was able to outline things, you know, perfectly 
because my experience has been in Massachusetts um, prison system, you know, which, as Rachel said, uses WellPath. So WellPath, you know, was sort of the entity that employed the medical people within the prison. Um, so a lot of my um, experiences have been, you know, actually all my experiences have been only with WellPath. Um, so the particular um, inmate that I became involved with, you know, I had not never known prior. Um, I had known a family member of his and they had actually reached out and asked and said that, you know, this person was dramatically sick and could I look at his medical records? And that was like, I think 14 years ago. So when I first looked at his medical records, you know, for the medical people out there, um, it was shocking to me that this person wasn't in a hospital. Um, and so unbeknownst to me, I didn't really realize how the system worked. I just said, well, he needs to see the hepatology people. He needs to see infectious disease and he needs to see hematology. And why can't we just do that? And not knowing that therein lies the problem, right? And so over the years, you know, it, it was sort of an advocacy to try. He had untreated hepatitis C and then the myriad of complications that arose from that. So initially it was trying to get him hepatitis C treatment, which um, at the time, you know, he qualified for and ultimately we were able to obtain it, you know, via some help with the, actually going to the Senate office to get help. Um, and then over the years, you know, his health declined where he had, um, you know, liver cancer, cirrhosis, portal hypertension, like a whole host of, you know, diagnoses related and ultimately um, the hepatocellular carcinoma. So his care went outside of the prison to, and then it was actually outside of the prison associated hospital as well, because the hospitals that did the transplants were not necessarily affiliated with the DOC. So my experience was different depending on whether it was within the you know prison system or outside the prison system. So it was very easy, and I had turned out to be his healthcare proxy as well at the end. And so um, communicating with the hospitals not affiliated with the Department of Corrections was very easy because they, from my perspective, you know, had the patient's best interest in mind, right? They just wanted to get him the liver transplant and get him the care he needed. Um, and then within WellPath, it was all the barriers, as you, no one could predict, you know, every wall that could be put up, um, trying to save costs, prevent care, you know, stone wall, stall. Um, you know, so, so that was sort of my experience, you know, definitely different depending who you were dealing with. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for sharing about the, the individual client himself. Um, yeah, so these these issues with care can happen, and especially delays of care uh, and sometimes inappropriate care for the the setting. Now we've seen I've from working at the Medical Justice Alliance, we do a lot of similar cases, and this can be a very common issue. Uh, you you brought up one one way that you were able to address that by actually getting a, another external medical provider to reach out to the physician or reach out to the physician, reach out to the facility and try to um, convince them of doing that. I want to bring it over to Mercedes next and understanding, you know, this is not an uncommon issue where either patients have concern, medical concerns that haven't been addressed or they're having significant delays in care. Do you have other tips for lawyers who are kind of in, in this um, setting to help kind of nudge and address these delays in care? So sort of going back to what Will mentioned at the very beginning, people are constitutionally provided medical care. That's a requirement. And actually the thing that we've had the most luck with is going to elected officials and having them reach out to the Department of Corrections. So your local state rep, your local um, state senator. Um, I actually think on an individual level of a family who lives in a district where you are represented by a person, um, they can go to the Department of Corrections and they can make trouble and they have a lot of power. And um, honestly, of all the things I've tried, um, that is the way that I have been able to move things most significantly, um, is to really go on to your local representative and push them um, to push on your behalf. If it's a local facility, your city council member, um, I really urge folks to reach out directly to those people. And um, that has two effects. One, it raises 
the awareness of elected officials about oftentimes things that they don't learn about in conversations that they're not having. Um, and it also puts your loved one on their radar. Put things in writing, fax them, email them. If you call, follow up with an email, follow up with a fax. I know that sounds crazy, but many prisons still use fax machines. Um, but create a paper trail, uh, a document paper trail. <clears throat> Oftentimes, we'll get things from our clients, which are these meticulously handwritten logs of every, you know, interaction that they've had with a person. And one of the realities of working with people who are incarcerated is, and I'm not saying this is right, this is dead wrong, no one believes them. So everything that you have to do in advocating for them, you have to create records and things that are going to verify and lift up their stories. And so as an advocate, I just urge people to document your conversations, the things that you're doing, because the power that that will hold will be infinitely more um, than something our clients sent to us, unfortunately. Yeah. Thank you for raising those points. And uh, <laughs> I, I love your, your perspective of going to make good trouble with you know, elected officials, uh, and whether it's, yeah, levering elected officials, other trusted medical providers, leaving a paper trail so they can see, you know, this is the duration that's been going on, as well as all the ad other administrative approaches um, that can be really helpful for lawyers. Now, I was going to uh, bring it back to Rachel, who's actually practiced uh, significantly within this setting. Uh, could you just describe a little bit more of uh, what it's like to receive care within the carceral setting? for patients. Oh. Sorry, amateur move. Okay. So I think that um, the 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 most important thing to sort of understand about um, all car carceral settings is that there's fairly limited freedom of movement, right? And so people do not get to just decide that they're going to make a doctor's appointment and then bring themselves to that doctor's appointment. What happens is that um, if you apply, you know, if you apply, if you put in for sick call, right, that goes into some kind of list system where somebody triages and says, yes, we'll see that person. Then your name goes on a list to be produced by officers to the clinic. So, you know, an officer has to usually come and get a patient and bring them to clinic um, where um, uh, you are jail, in jails and prisons, as you, you know, might imagine, clinics are, um, very chaotic places generally, and they're places with very limited privacy. Um, and uh, so at Rikers, for example, the majority of the clinics that are situated in the jails um, have these cubicles with these sort of half walls, right? So there's not full walls where you're like really totally shielded as you're disclosing your most private medical information or you're even being examined. Um, and there are officers and other patients and other providers just sort of milling about. Um, and the it is not a place that's very conducive to building a strong therapeutic relationship um because officers then have to bring you to everything else so if you are going to get blood drawn or you're going to be referred for a specialty appointment or you're going to be um uh sent to um, the hospital for something, right? Officers have to accompany you for all of those things as well. And so there's just an, a built-in delay to any next step in care while the security side gets ready to be able to assist around that movement. And there's also a barrier to delivering it because it's resource intensive even to do minor things, right? To get someone to physical therapy um, is actually a very resource intensive thing for the system to do relative to not doing it. And so the default is to just not do things and not produce people to clinic um, to uh, accept when a patient says, I, you know, I need five minutes before I can go and for the officer to say, okay, forget it. You're not coming. Never mind. Goodbye. Um, so uh, it's just really, it's a really difficult place to deliver care for lots of reasons. Yeah, it's, <laughs> we have def definitely struggled with that with a number of our clients we've worked with, especially you had mentioned with mobility uh, limited patients where it takes a correctional officer and has to get the wheelchair and whether it's missing legal calls, whether it's missing health appointments, that can really, really delay the, the patient's care. Yeah, absolutely. 
So uh, with with issues like this, I know uh, Mercedes, you had brought up before about um, kind of using American Dis with the Disabilities Act. Are there other other uh, like other ways you found from a lawyer perspective that you can help kind of make sure that all these other all these other things that pre even prevent a patient from accessing a physician, how to get those to fall into better place? Uh, I wish I had a, a very positive answer. I, I think building a strong relationship with the medical community that serves our patients has served us incredibly well. Um, we work, we have um, an amazing group of medical providers in Louisiana who are passionate about delivering our clients amazing care. And that has been just like a really wonderful way to do have really productive and learning moments. We try to create learning opportunities for, for medical students to learn about what the experience of incarcerated people looks like. And so when they encounter our patients, they're encountering them with a, with a different lens. Um, and then doctors themselves and the advocacy that they provide in so many ways is so much more valuable. A civil rights lawyer is labeled very early in an interaction um, with the prison as being someone who could potentially sue them, someone who is looking for them to make a mistake. And so our role in the advocacy phase um, can sometimes be less than it should be. I mean, certainly there have been moments when you pick up the phone and you say, this is the situation. And there are, and I want to be clear that there are people inside the system who are trying to provide quality care. Um, but the system is so violent, it's very hard. And, and I don't mean like violent in the physical way. I mean, the system promotes a certain violence. It, it's designed to isolate people. Um, and so when you're trying to provide care to them, um, it's almost like a, a, a dissonance. Mm -hmm. yeah. And maybe Rachel, as, as someone who is a, a caring provider within that setting, have you found any creative ways that lawyers have helped uh, you know, grease the wheels of the system as it were? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I uh, one of the things that I did when uh, at Rikers was I led our compassionate release work. Um, and we had an incredibly close relationship with um, many of our patients' attorneys. Um, and one of the things that I would say is for anybody who's ever considering going into correctional health is um, the, the sort of default culture within correctional health is to feel that the uh, just as Mercedes said, jail, jails and prisons are incredibly violent places. They're structurally violent. And that uh, that ends up impacting everyone, both people who work there and people who are being held there. And everybody becomes sort of disempowered um, very easily by how much the system is designed to prevent you being able to um, change anything, right? And so um, one of the sort of best things that um, uh, we did was we um, proactively would reach out to our patients' attorneys when we had somebody who was ill, and we would say, "Do you know that this? Do you know that your client has X, Y, Z condition, this cancer, this heart failure? Um, what can we do to help you advocate for them on the outside? Um, what's the status of their case so that we can plan their care around what's going to on with their case? Like it, that the." to remember that people who are incarcerated have simultaneous um, medical issues and legal issues that are ongoing and that those things are always intersecting and often in tension with one another um, in jails especially where people are mostly in pretrial detention and there's a lot of uncertainty hanging over how long they're going to be detained um, and so one of the best things that we did was we became more sort of aggressive and proactive about reaching out to attorneys and making those connections early and then really coordinating a plan that took into account both what was going on on the legal side and what was going on on the medical side. That's amazing that you were able to take that proactive approach and I'm sure many lawyers would love to have uh, physicians within the prison system to remind them of things like that. I, I know personally I have uh, for a number of cases have for patients who have critical illness or end of life care, I've reached out to prisons because a lot of times they don't have the, the same resources to be on top of it. And even a quick call with the prison physician, if, if I'm saying, you know, this gentleman has metastatic liver cancer, um, would, would it help if we, you know, wrote up a hospice referral for you to help to like submit? things like that, that really makes it easier for them, takes one thing off their plate. 
can make a huge difference for individual clients. I see, I see Rachel nodding, so <laughs> potentially could help. So uh, now we can turn a little bit more to um, briefly about medical care outside of the actual uh, prison. And I wanted to bring it back to Susan, who has kind of worked with uh, individuals who are in, in custody and or uh, clients who have been outside of the prison. So have you, Susan, for, for seeing people who have gotten care outside of the facility, have you bumped into any um, any issues with their receiving care, with their access to um, documentation, things like that? Um, I think on that note, the biggest, I'd say, issue that I've come across is actually getting the inmate to the appointment when they're supposed to be at the appointment, you know, so for numbers of reasons, the transport van doesn't show up. Um, they don't have enough extra COs to escort the patient. Or um, I remember one example where the patient was supposed to have, I think, an endoscopy and he had a hard candy at the um, waiting for the van or something to that effect. And then they canceled the procedure and then, you know, the hospital rebooked it a week later, but somehow the message didn't get to the schedule at the prison. And you know, and I think it was like six months later rather than one week later by the time he, you know, this particular person had the procedure. So I think um, in general, I think for me anyway, the differentiation would be if the hospital facility is related or has a relationship with the DOC or does not. Um, so I can, you know, my experience in Massachusetts is more um, the the hospital institutions that don't have an inherent built-in relationship with the DOC, it's almost like you and I going to a medical appointment, right? It's almost like they get the care that you and I would get because that's what the hospital providers are used to providing. Whereas if they're going to sort of a um, an appointment or setting that the DOC has a relationship, it's more similar to my experience that has been more internal with the DOC with a lot more pushback and a lot more or a lot less accessibility to schedule procedures, et cetera. Yeah. Scheduling has been a, a, a chronic issue with that. And a lot of times it's difficult for the patients because they may be told by a physician in at the if they're at the hospital or at the clinic. They say, you know, you should have surgery within two weeks, but one, most of the time they are not, that's not privy to the, the individuals incarcerated for security reasons. They are not told when they're going to have the surgery. Uh, and then also they, it may get pushed back with the schedulers and things like that. Um, I know for my, my work in the emergency department, it's, it's difficult because a lot of times patients won't won't have the same access to medication. So if I try to prescribe them something for heroin withdrawal, to the, the carceral facility, they just won't have that medication or similar with, with um, not having medical uh, records or things like that. Maybe I could, we'll bring it back to Rachel. Um, as we talk a little bit, move more into in information and kind of medical decision-making for those who are incarcerated. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how those who are incarcerated can get access to the medical notes and access to the medications? It's incredibly difficult. So it depends on the system. I, I mean, I'll, I'll just share a quick anecdote, which is that my staff, there was that, you know, people are entitled to their own medical records. Like they really are entitled to have them, but the culture of um, blocking people from getting access to their own information is so strong in carceral facilities that I, when I had staff that um, would be seeing a patient, um, of ours in the clinic who would say something like, you know, can I have my CAT scan result? And one day I had a, one of our um, advocates said, of course, I'll print it for you. And DOC and three other doctors were like, you absolutely can't do that. Well, we absolutely could do that. Of course we could do that. You can absolutely, you know, this person is entitled to their own records and they're going to get them eventually, right? They're going to get them through a labor-intensive medical records request on the other side. We can just do acquire them right now. Um, but there is this real belief um, in correctional facilities that giving patients any information, including information they're entitled to, is somehow um, violating some boundary 
that um, needs to be maintained for security reasons, even when that's totally illogical. So it's really, really hard if you don't have strongly empowered clinical or advocacy staff on site in the correctional facility for people to get things in real time. What ends up happening is their family or attorney can make a medical records request um, to get their records you know, sent to their lawyer by fax or <laughs> whatever it is on the outside. That's very labor intensive. It often requires multiple phone calls to follow up. Um, it also can be just very practically difficult because to get a HIPAA signed by someone who is incarcerated is in and of itself really difficult to do. Um, and was especially for us a huge problem during um, the first wave of COVID when we had all of these patients who we knew were high risk for COVID related morbidity and mortality, um, where the lawyers wanted to be able to offer um, evidence of that to the courts um, in advocacy place to get the people released um, so that they were not uh, sitting in jail while COVID was ravaging through Rikers. Um, and uh, those folks didn't have a HIPAA signed. And so, and nobody was going in and out of the jails and they weren't being produced to court so they couldn't sign the HIPAA for their lawyer, right? Like it, it, the, the barriers to just getting um, that kind of paperwork complete is really, are really intense in prisons and jails. Um, so all of that is to say it's really, really hard. Um, and the workaround that my patients had was that they held on to every piece of paper that was ever given to them and they would show up to every appointment with 2,800, you know, pieces of paper, including like labs from 10 years ago that had nothing to do with what was going on with them now, because they really felt that they had to have on their person at all time their entire history. Um, um, as Because otherwise they sort of, you know, nothing, they couldn't rely on the system to, to, to find anything about them. I appreciate you bringing that up. Um, yeah, unfortunately that's been a lot of times to get the medical records, one, again, they're having to pay for medical records, um, go through a medical records department, and it can take weeks um, to get, or months to get information. Mercedes, do you have, for the, for the lawyers who are represented here, do you guys have any tips on how to get medical records more easily? I mean, HIPAA is a powerful statute and people are entitled to it. And I do think that there are ways to do legal actions around HIPAA. It's certainly not a specialty of mine, but it does, there, there are legal requirements to it. Um, I, I, I think what I see in carceral settings is a culture of being aware that patients don't get to see their medical records. And so I see a lot of disparaging comments inside of those records. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that like part of what's happened is that there's this sort of unprofessional communication within those records that if patients could see them would dramatically change, I think, how people are spoken about. Um, I think the other thing um, and I think, and I think is important to bring to light. Like, I do think those are really important things. We still have a lot of carceral settings still have paper records and that causes a whole other set of problems. And, um, you know, just as anecdotally, um, we've had medical providers tell us that patients will show up, um, you know, non-responsive to the hospital, to the emergency room and the people who've transported them can't tell them, for example, like what their insulin what insulin they take it that day, what, you know, ins how insulin dependent they are, like Im information that providers tell me are important that you would want to know about someone when they were unresponsive. Um, and so that, that need to carry those papers around with you is real um, in, in like a really tangible way too. Yeah, that sounds like Rachel had a, a comment. Yeah, sorry, I raised my hand. I, just two, two additional thoughts on that. One is that um, uh, the, this, this sort of, cult of secrecy that the and and the the real effort not to let people um just to, to separate people from their own medical knowledge as much as possible as frankly as a form of control i think um is so pervasive then it also extends very very much to getting collateral information that can be really critical to patient care so for example a person um, comes into the jail system and is, um, seems to be floridly delirious. And, you know, there's a wide differential for what could be going on. And providers are just really discouraged from calling outside providers, from calling family members, from getting information about that person, um, doing sort of all of the normal things one would do if they were in a hospital emergency room to get a full sense of the picture. Um, Similarly, when patients are facing difficult diagnoses while incarcerated, you are, it, the, the culture really discourages 
involving family in any of those conversations, even though if that person was, you know, was, was a civilian hospitalized, you know, who had just gone a cancer diagnosis, you would never have that conversation without the wife present, right? Um, but these systems thrive on being able to isolate people as much as possible. Um, and so either with um, uh, sort of formal policies or just informal sort of cultural controls, they really discourage that. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that um, about medical records with disparaging comments is that Oh. Incarcerated, and that uh, they are often blamed for their own health, their own health issues, um, and so the language in the chart is often very blaming around, like, well, if he had done this, we went position, or he refused three times, so now obviously he's really sick, or whatever it is, without any sort of full context to explore the reasons for those refusals. Um, and so we, over time, in our advocacy work with lawyers, became less interested in being able to produce all 2,000 pages of someone's medical records to court. And more, um, we became pretty intentional about excerpting from those records the most relevant um, pieces of information that would also not provide anything that might arm the prosecutor's side with um, an uh, an argument that the patient had in some way malingered or like manipulated their own case or whatever it was. That's great to great to hear. And I think it's good for I mean a lot of us to know this, whether you are a clinician, understanding, trying to get these patients as much like for myself, I'm an ER physician. So when I'm working with people who are incarcerated or police involved, I'm trying to get them as much information, trying to write that down and trying to make sure that they leave the hospital with at least some sort of access to it is important, both, both for the patient to understand, but also for the facility to understand what your recommendations are and what should be done. Uh, and, and Rachel brings up the point of, I, I think the dangers of it, if, if patients are labeled kind of as a malinger, as kind of faking this or to blame for their medical problems, that that can, uh, it can really dissuade judges from trying to get them the, the relief they need. So um, now I think moving <laughs> moving beyond that, I, I know we have, we've talked about trying to get medical records. I know Mercedes had mentioned trying to curry a little favor with, with those who are in the medical records department or who, those who are at the prison, because sometimes that can, uh, again, move things along more quickly. Um, but I, I want to now turn a little bit more to a, a topic that Rachel brought up, which is kind of the topic of trust within these facilities. So with, within the medical uh, relationship between a doctor and a patient, it is very um, dependent on trust. These are very sensitive issues. These are very personal issues. So I just wanted to bring um, that up and talk with Rachel a little bit. How does, how does uh, trust between medical providers and uh, patients at th these facilities affect their medical care? I think um, jails and prisons are places that are fundamentally characterized by mistrust and by violence. Um, violence in the sense that there's a, just that they are structurally violent and also in the sense that any actual interpersonal conflict has the potential to escalate into interpersonal violence in a way that is just not true in any other arena in society. Um, so um, that creates an incredible amount of tension <laughs> in these in, in these environments that um, is really distinct from being sort of anywhere else. Um, that's one thing. The other thing, though, is just that there is the culture. There's a culture of mistrust between patients and providers, um, especially that's made much worse, I think, if the providers work directly for the security authority and have the have the dual loyalty that that implies. So. Um, providers, as we've all talked about, are sort of conditioned to be suspicious of patient motives, to really stigmatize their concerns, um, to see them as sort of 
care seeking and manipulative often uh, often and to then to, to interact with them in a way that's informed by that perspective. Um, and because that's the way that patients are often approached in that in this environment, patients are really mistrustful of clinicians in prisons and jails. And with good reason, because they are places where they don't have prior existing relationships. There's not a lot of emphasis on continuity of care. Um, appointments are non-private and often rushed and often not on the schedule what that you know where that um, was uh, requested and um, and are often fundamentally unsatisfying in their outcomes. And so there's this really bad sort of detente where patients are like, you know, this doctor is not going to help me anyway. And the doctor is like, I don't, I, I'm not going to give this guy what he wants. And that's a really difficult starting place from which to build a therapeutic relationship and to overcome it requires a huge amount of work um, in relationship building and then getting to know patients. And um, most doctors are not empowered to do that in this setting. Thank you for bringing that up. It is, it's a very difficult time when it, it can feel that patients are, are pitted against the medical facility or they don't trust what's going on. Maybe we can bring it over to, to Susan, who's, who's worked with people who maybe don't feel that same level of trust. Have there been ways or tactics that have worked well for you in terms of working to rebuild that trust within the medical um, system in general, but then also allying or yeah, allying a little bit more with the carceral system? Um, how to answer that? I feel like um, there's a few different ways to go with that question. Um, but I think that the trust thing is huge, obviously. And I think that when there's, there, when their trust is not there, there's all, there's a disconnect from the get-go, right? Like you already are like at a lose-lose if there's not that trust to be had. And um, and it actually, ironically enough, with the whole medical records, you know, belonging to you and you have a right to your own medical records, that's something that I had always tried to say, well, look, you have a right to your records, you know, like in, you know, in my particular situation, I spoke to these people on the phone, the, the inmates on the phone. And so... I said, get your records, call me and read me the results and I'll tell you if what they're doing seems appropriate, right? And then that leads to an issue with most of the time they were not given their records and that led to like, well, you're entitled to your records and you know, kind of circling back to the whole medical records. But in situations where they were able to get records or x-ray reports or um, anything, you know, you can sort of talk them through, okay, that sounds reasonable, right? Now, obviously, if you're not a medical person, it's hard to talk somebody through their test results being, you know, that their medication is appropriate or their care is appropriate. Um, but that was one thing that worked, you know, for the people that I tried to help was at least trying to give them reassurance that, you know, yes, this medication is okay for this, um, or no, this seems to be a big miss. I think you need to say this, this, and this. Um, so I think that that was sort of helpful. Um, Unfortunately, I think in, in my particular scenarios, there was more mistrust than trust. And both from, you know, my perspective from the medical side and, you know, the inmate side, more from the, the, the social side that they just didn't, I mean, I wish that Rachel could come work in some of the prison systems that I've dealt with because there was not any of that same mindset, you know, that we came across. Yeah, I think I think a lot of people would wish wish they had uh, prison physicians like Rachel, <laughs> and hopefully uh, talks like this can help e equip people more. Um, now, another big tenet of kind of medical ethics that we've discussed about is kind of the, the right to choose care, um, discussing whether whether patients can accept or or choose to um, decline care. Now, I, I wanted to bring it over to Mercedes uh, to first give us a little legal framework about this. So with, with patients who are incarcerated, how does that work? If both, like, what, what can they choose to accept and refuse in terms of medical care? And then if they are not in a position to make medical decisions for themselves, how does the system manage that? Well, so 
the the end of the they're not in a position to make medical choices in general um there has been a lot of movement here to identify for for folks to have the ability to identify someone who can make those medical choices for them but absent that then the system makes the medical choices and i do think that there are like some real concern ethical concerns there that are not my specialty but but super super challenging you know here's the thing about the the um the patient care choices. Patients can always refuse care, um, but the danger of refusing care is, is really threefold. One, when will that care come back around? So I have a patient who has an ulcer um, in, a, it, in his groin area, essentially, and being transported for three hours to a medical appointment is extremely painful for him especially if he doesn't know what that medical appointment is, what's, what's involved in it, and if he's going to be properly transported. This particular patient was, has, was transported with a black box in a wheelchair along bumpy country roads in Louisiana, and the pain that he must have endured was, when I think about it, insane. Um, and so, like, when and how they, they, they do that, but then if he refuses that medical appointment, it might be three or four or five months before it comes back around to him. So I think that there's a real danger there. The second danger is the danger of being labeled as a refuser and then the doctors and the motivation of the team becoming substantially less. And then we certainly see it in a legal context, finally, where people bring up these refusals as an excuse for, for failure to provide adequate medical care. So for example, uh, a patient who has radiation therapy has never ever refused anything in his entire medical record starts refusing his daily meds. So they count that as quote 30 refusals. Well, for the duration of his radiation, one could imagine multitude of reasons why when someone wakes up in the morning, the, the taking their daily medication um, may not be comfortable for them. They may be throwing up. They, there's all sorts of other symptoms that could be present, no documentation in the record, but it excuses delays of care. It excuses bad outcomes. Um, and it, and, and it ex so, so there is a legal concern Personally, it's not very compelling to me, but there's always a danger that a court is going to look at that and say, well, they tried to provide him care. He refused it. I'm not going to get into the details. Yeah, thank you. For, thank you for sharing. It's, it's, it's difficult in those situations um, and trying to really unravel. It, it can take a, a bit of work to try and unravel what is leading to the refusal. And ideally, be, patients are trying to work with their providers and uh, work together, but it's it's understandable and it can affect them in the future. Um, now, I think maybe we can talk a little bit more about, uh, for Rachel, who has worked with uh, a number of people who are elderly and kind of near the end of life, do you, do you have any any thoughts on end of life care and how, um, how staff uh, make decisions about end of life care and what is the, the patient's rights with that? So many thoughts. This is a, this is something I have the most thoughts about. So, um, a few things. So, the, on the question of decision making and end of life decision making, it, it, it brings in some of the things we've already talked about. One is that um, it's incredibly difficult, and, and this is you know this is a tenet of palliative care, right? It's incredibly difficult to ask people to make decisions about end of life care. Um, in isolation, we never do that in the community, right? In the community, what we do is we host a family meeting where the wife and the son and the daughter-in-law and like the neighbor are all there and everybody gets to sort of be in the room to make hard, hard decisions together and to, um, to share the emotional intensity about together. When you do that with people who are incarcerated and they're in total isolation and they are in a situation where the prospect of dying while inside is so painful, it's very compromising to the decision-making process, right? So I'll give you an example, which is that I, I had several patients who um, had serious or terminal illness who would have chosen to be DNR, DNI if they were in the community, but they chose to be full code when they were incarcerated in jail because they were so terrified of dying in jail that they did not want to do anything that would make them more likely. Um, so the first thing is just that the, the, the very fact of being incarcerated compromises people's decision making and then we make it harder by not letting them connect with their loved ones as they're going through care. Um, 
the second thing I would say is that um, as people are near the end of their lives, the ability of different correctional facilities to provide symptom relief is incredibly variable. Um, and so um, in some places, um, Louisiana has a really nice prison hospice. California has the California Medical Facility, which um, provides um, pretty nice hospice care. Um, there are lots of, you know, but there are lots of systems that don't have anything that provides anything close to community standard end of life care. And people are going through serious symptoms without any real attention or medicine to be able to mitigate those for them. Um, in those cases, sometimes people are moved to the hospital for the end of their life experience, but then they're in a hospital where they're really, so they're isolated. You know, if you are someone who's been a long-termer and you've spent decades in prison and you have a real community that you've built in there, it actually is not a relief to be transported to the hospital for the final weeks of your life and die totally alone away from anyone who knows you. Um, so that's not actually always a great solution either. Um, I feel very strongly that um, despite all of the achievements of prison hospices around the country, that um, we actually can't provide community standard palliative care and hospice care to people who are incarcerated because incarceration itself creates such fundamental barriers to that care um, that yes, okay, building that capacity for the folks who are not going to get out um, is worthwhile, but really overwhelmingly what we should be doing is advocating for release when somebody has a limited prognosis. Um, and 46 states systems in the Federal Bureau of Prisons have medical parole or compassionate release policies that are theoretically in place to be able to do that. They are all underused, um, but they do exist. <laughs> and so in my mind, Building some palliative care or geriatric capacity within systems is important, but more important is expanding the use of the medical parole options. Thank you so much for sharing that about, um, about so issues. Of, oh, go ahead. Yes. Can I just add, so the, the other thing about hospice care that I think is important to talk about is that oftentimes prisons really limit access to pain medication. And so the, the, it's not made, it's not a freely made decision if the only way you can access pain medication is by going into a hospice program. And um, we've definitely seen that with patients in the system where they're just in immense pain and they sort of give in because they're like, well, the only way I'm going to get the good pain meds is if I go into hospice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's very tragic. Um, yeah, so we've, we've seen, especially with, with end-of-life care, in terms of decision-making, whether whether patients have access to their family or whether they're kind of barred from talking with them about these really difficult decisions, about difficulties getting access to the, the medications they need. So there's still a lot of work um, within that realm. Uh, I want to leave a few minutes for questions, but before that, um, first off, thank you so much for to all the panelists for bringing your expertise to this topic. Uh, I think both uh, whether whether you're a, a clinician, whether you are um, a lawyer, I think this is really really helpful, or even just an advocate for those who who are incarcerated. Uh, I just want to ask, kind of finally, for each of you, uh, do you have any other best tips or techniques that you've seen? Um, to help kind of nudge the system to get patients the care they need. Um, I, I wouldn't mind just jumping in for a second. Um, I think in my experience, I think the perseverance is the main thing. Um, I think inherently it seems to me that the, the people that you are allowed to communicate with, their job is to put up walls. And I feel like from the advocate side, the best thing you can do is try to find a way or an avenue around that wall. And it may not be the same from circumstance to circumstance or prison system to prison system. But I think that, you know, if you can kind of be the bulldog and just keep pushing, you know, you'll find a way around. And, um, you know, and I think that there are like legal services that are helpful in these situations if you're not a legal person. Uh, so I guess maybe I'll chime in and then either if Rachel and Mercedes, if there are any tips you haven't, we haven't covered, that's great. Um, but I, I would say one, one thing I agree with, uh, being very persistent with it, uh, and then to trying to, um, 
to leverage whatever community support resources you have. We talked about elected officials. Um, my organization, the Medical Justice Alliance, actually has volunteer physicians who are willing to review cases. Because a lot of times lawyers don't have the same medical training and they don't always know. They get a stack of paper of medical records like this and they don't know is, is this appropriate care or isn't it appropriate care? So I think by, by leveraging having a volunteer physician review the case pro bono and maybe either provide oral consultation or write up a, a expert witness testimony saying that, I think that can go a long way to even just clarifying the situation. And then if, if Rachel or Mercedes, if you guys have any, any last tips, we can do that. Otherwise, we'll let's move into questions and feel free to interject any tips. Uh, the audience had some amazing, amazing questions about uh, kind of regarding all this care. So we can, I thought maybe we could start um, with uh, Joel. Joel had actually um, discussed or asked the question of do prison authorities uh, uh, connect approval of healthcare treatment to patients' behavior or alleged behavior? Yeah, absolutely. So um, um, this is the most true around um, uh, things that people need chronically. So, um, you know, if someone's, if, if, so a few things. So this goes back to the mistrust question, which is, you know, if somebody has reported that they've had chest pain several times in the past um, and it has not turned out to be a significant cardiac condition. When they say that they have chest pain now, the chance that they are dismissed as a malingerer who's manipulating in order to get to the hospital, et cetera, et cetera, is very high. Um, so it's absolutely, there is, um, there is a perception that patients are often seeking medical care um, for second, secondary gain. And so, and, and that's evaluated against the context of their other behaviors and sort of interactions with the system. And so medical care is often withheld um, because there's suspicion that it's not actually warranted or it's not really needed. Um, similarly, and conversely, when patients are really well behaved and never have any disciplinary infractions, et cetera, et cetera, they're much more likely to be taken seriously and much more likely to get what they need. Um, uh, so, and then around chronic issues, so things like um, a person needs to get, you know, finger sticks several times a day for their diabetes or whatever. Um, that's so many potentially hostile interactions. Um, and it's quite burdensome for the system to execute on that. And so the threshold to just not do it is very low, right? Like, it's just very easy for the you know, the officer and the nurse who have to go get the guy to do the finger stick to be like, ugh, you know, he doesn't want, he, he was an asshole this morning, we're not going to do it or whatever it is. Um, and I think that also happens all the time. Thank you for sharing. Wait, sorry, I have one more thing about that, which is just the other, the other, other thing is obviously there's a huge burden of um, significant mental illness in this population. And so um, people's medical concerns are often conflated with or dismissed as um, symptoms um, or related to their, to their mental illness. Um, and so I think that people who have serious mental illness are even more vulnerable to not getting the care they need in this setting. Yeah. Um, so I know we are at the, the one hour mark, we're just a tiny bit over. So I just wanted to do one last question. Um, I, for those of you who asked questions, there were a lot of great ones we weren't able to get to. I'm more than happy to answer those if, um, if you email. Um, and otherwise, I thought um, the, last, the last one I thought would be interesting to discuss is in terms of care after. We talked a little bit about patients who are released for compassionate really reasons. Um, how, what does care look like for them afterwards? Is it easier to get care? Is it more difficult to get care? Um, anyone can answer, but I think Mercedes is shaking her head. I mean, it's much easier. Um, I, I mean, I've, I've walked a lot of people through some pretty substantial illnesses that are diagnosed right after they're incarcerated, which as you can imagine is a pretty tragic situation that occurs with some regularity. 
Um, but yeah, the access to care, even in a place, even in a state that's pretty poor, that doesn't have, is it known for its like robust um, medical care system? Um, it has, has been tremendous. And I will say that patients, um, one thing we do really well in Louisiana and that all systems should really focus on is getting people enrolled in Medicaid before they get out um, because it has made just a tremendous difference for our clients. And we've seen people um, really, really show improvements, whether they were released for compassionate reasons or for just normal reasons, just we've seen them um, been able to control th their diseases much better and, and live much healthier lives. Great. Well, with that, I would like to thank you all. Thanks for everyone who tuned in. Uh, we really appreciate uh, your interest in this. Please feel free to reach out to the, the Petri Foam um, crew if you have any other questions that we can answer. Thank you again uh, for all the organizations that hosted this, and we hope you'll tune in for our next uh, seminar series, part four. I'll look for that to be out in the next within the next month. Thank you so much. Thank you.